everyone. Uh, welcome to the second uh, morning of the Battle of Ideas uh, Festival. My name is Alan Miller. I'm a director of the New York Salon uh, and one of the co-conveners of the International Battle of Ideas Satellite Festival. Uh, I'm going to introduce the panel and we're going to get into uh, their introductions very fast this morning. My introductions to them will be very short, although each of them has a very extensive biography, which is very impressive. So I encourage you to uh, look them up uh, because I'm not going to have time to cover all of their achievements, which are very impressive. Just to set the tone and the context, we wanted to have a discussion about some of the new things in the discussion uh, around Israel, uh, hence the name Pathologizing Israel, some of the new developments in that context. And uh, in the spirit of the battle of ideas, uh, we, uh, I often say this in New York when I'm there because it's sometimes uh, slightly different in New York, but we encourage people to say absolutely anything but in a civil way uh, and in a, in a calm and rational way because we're all adults and we can cope with those ideas uh, in, a, in a calm and, and sensible, rational way. So, um, this morning we've got, as I said, a great panel. Immediately next to me is Ben Gros Yemeni, who is a journalist and he's a co columnist and opinion page editor for the daily newspaper Ma'ariv. And he has a book out called Political Punch, which is a critique of politics and society in Israel. And I should say that um, most of the books uh, of the panelists are, are available at foils at the desk downstairs. I also actually want to say um, a very big thank you to Ruth Saunders for helping with the uh, Anglo-Israel Association, who are partners on this session. To my far left, uh, geographically here, is uh, Baroness Ruth Deitch, who's a crossbench peer, uh, and she's the chairman of Bar Standards Board. She was the chair for seven years for the UK Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority, uh, and oversaw the legislation on stem cell research. She was also a governor of the BBC from 2002 to 2006, and she released a life peer, uh, in two, uh, she achieved a peerage in 2005 and sits on the House of Lords uh, as a non-party legislator. Uh, at the end is Paul Bew, uh, who's a professor of Irish politics and also a lord at, uh, at Queen's University Belfast, and Paul is the chair of the Anglo-Israel Association. Uh, he's also the author of uh, the Ireland volume in the Oxford History of Modern Europe, and the book The Making and Remaking of the Good Friday Agreement. And directly next to me is Daniel Benami, who's a finance and economist journalist, and he's also an author of Ferraris for All in Defense of Economic Progress and Cowardly Capitalism. Just a couple of notes, you're probably all familiar with the, with the uh, format now, but um, after about six minutes or so, I'll be giving uh, the panel the yellow card, uh, and then uh, after seven, it will be the red card. Um, and then what we'll be doing after the introductions, we'll do a few uh, interactions and then we'll be going straight out to the audience. So, um, without further ado, ado, I'd like to get straight into, uh, into the introductions from the panellists actually. So, um, can we hear from you please, Ben Yep. You're chairman of ladies and gentlemen. I want to read you a sentence. Listen carefully. Gas chambers are not the only way to destroy a nation. It's enough to develop high rates of infant mortality. It was written about Israel, Israel and the Palestinians. The writer tried to say, look, the Israelis are behaving like the Nazis. But they have new ways to do it. They don't have to kill. They commit a genocide. But by another way. It was published in a very prestigious magazine. London Review of Books. In that time, when it was published, 11 years ago, I was part of the peace camp in Israel. In many ways, still I am. And I was wondering, what is it? Is my country committing a genocide against the Palestinians? And I don't know. In a very tricky way. I did something very simple. I went 
to the World Bank and to the World Health Organization to look for the real data about infant mortality among Palestinians under the Israeli control. Maybe it was distant to you. And I found out something very interesting. Infant mortality decreased dramatically. And I was asking myself, what happened here? How comes that such a prestigious review can publish a blatant lie? What about facts checking? I was wondering. Of course that I tried to correct them. Look, the information that you published is, sorry to say, a blood libel. <coughs> it's a blood libel. It never happened. The opposite happened. It was never published. Freedom of speech, we spoke about it before, includes the freedom to publish lies. Yes, it is. That's how it is in uh, the United States under the First Amendment. That's how it is in Israel. I guess somehow that's how it is also here in Britain. But to refute should be part of the freedom of speech. But it was not given. And many people are living under the impression that Israel is committing a genocide against the Palestinians. Now, if it was one article, one expression, one paragraph, no, it's not. This is the school of mind about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's made of lies. Deceptions. Too many. Let me tell you something. There are main, there are four main lies. One of them is uh, the genocide that is taking place. I'll give you an example from uh, someone that uh, uh, you might know, Claire Shaw. He was a minister here in Britain. A quote. The oppression of the Palestinian people is the senior, it is, sorry, is the major cause to violence in the world. Wow, major cause. I again did something very simple. How many people were killed? Since the foundation of Israel up to now, or oh, let's uh, uh, be more accurate, since the end of the Second World War up to now, 86 million people. Out of them, 12 million people were killed in the Arab world, in the Arab and Muslim world. Most of them by Arab and Muslim. The contribution of Israel since its Foundation up to now, it's 60,000 people. I'm not proud about one person that was killed. I'm not. During the more than 40 uh, years of Israeli control over the West Bank and Gaza Strip, we're speaking about between 8 to 9,000 people. Which means that the contribution of Israel to violence in the world is statistically zero. Facts. I know that some people don't care about facts. They have beliefs which are much more important. But let's talk about facts. And it goes on. Ethnic cleansing, refugees, Nakba. I guess most of you know what does it mean, Nakba. The catastrophe. People were forced out. In 48, after the UN resolution, two states or two peoples, an Arab state, a Jewish state, 
the, decision, the decision of the UN was rejected by all the Arab world. They declared war. And because of the war, people were forced out. Yes, it happened. But let me tell you, between 50 to 60 million people were forced out in order to establish new nation states. It happened. And a bigger number of Jews were forced out of our countries because of the same conflict. But you don't hear about it. The forgotten refugees, how come? When you single out one conflict, one state, the outcome is terrible. But we are facing an industry of lies about the conflict. The main problem is, and I am a peace supporter, I'm pro-Israeli, I'm pro-Palestinian, I'm pro-peace. There's so many deceptions, there's so many lies about the Middle East conflict are becoming counterproductive to peace. And this is the main problem that people don't understand. It. You do not have the Palestinians. Last sentence. I spoke about Claire Shaw. I have to finish. She blamed Israel in the global warming. I have no idea what is the connection between Israel and the global warming. But, but when people are obsessed, it's all the way. Thank you for listening. I've already raised some uh, interesting points there. Uh, Ruth, over to you, please. When I go on holiday, I like to be anonymous because they want to talk politics. A couple of years ago, I was on holiday, kept myself to myself. The very last day, a lady came up to me and she said, I know who you are, she said. You're the one that every time you open your mouth, you upset somebody. So, uh, true to form, I'm about to do the same. I start with the definition of anti-Semitism, because that is what underlies the theories I'm going to put forward in my allotted time. Take Bernard Lewis. Anti-Semitism is different because Jews are judged by a standard different from others. They are viewed globally, not as individuals, their actions affect the whole world. This is echoed in the European Monitoring Centre on Racism and Xenophobia and their definition, which included, but is not confined to, targeting the State of Israel conceived as a Jewish collectivity, denying the Holocaust, denying the Jewish right to self-determination, applying by the standards. Now, just working within that framework, or even something narrower, there are some things that are peculiarly British, given that we're talking here in London. The boycott, divest and sanctions movement, the university and college unions adoption of a militantly anti-Israel stand. Elsewhere in Europe, it's the extreme right that's hostile to Jews. But here we find it is the left-wing identification. The left-wing identification is suicide bombers, Hezbollah, Hamas, anti-gay and anti-women clerics. Their views would otherwise be anathema to the left, but they pass for standard when Israel is involved in the discussion. So there is something peculiarly <coughs> British about it. And I think the pro-Jewish movement in this country never took on strength, unlike, say, the movement to end slavery or giving equality to women and gays. But I have no doubt that the anti-Israel hysteria that we encounter every day here is fertile ground for anti-Semitic incidents, or is a cloak for anti-Semitism, and the speed with which it's become established as legitimate has created an immunity for anti-Semitic discourse that would have been unthinkable 50 years ago. A few instances, but I want to get on to the reasons for this. You read very readily, or you hear in Parliament, as I do, that Israel poisons the atmosphere, poisons the water, poisons Yasser Arafat, takes organs from corpses, denies medical treatment to Palestinians, that the fence is unique, which it certainly isn't, and then, again, peculiarly British. The assault by, I think, very appropriately called Philistines, in my view, the cultural assaults on orchestras, on academia, uh, interference with the Jerusalem Quartet, Nigel Kennedy launching insults 
from his platform at the end of the proms, the interruption of the Merchant of Venice at the Globe Theatre, and so on. Even the article recently about Ed Miliband's father. I don't know about his politics, but that article, to me, was a sotto voce reminder. Remember, he's Jewish. That's what it seemed to me to be. And then, of course, uh, the way that uh, all Israelis are treated responsible for everything, or Jews are treated responsible for anything <laughs> Israel does wrong, the abuse of the Holocaust experience, and my theory is that the twisting of Holocaust history is the method Europeans have absorbed in order to try and cleanse themselves of the guilt they ought to bear. And being a part of Europe makes it more acute. We are all being bundled up together with Germany again, and of course we have, once again, an economic recession with a very important German part in it, which has revived extreme right-wing organizations in Europe. Um, the critics of Israel say, oh no, they're not anti-Semitic, they are martyrs for the truth. But frankly, the amount of uh, air and time that they get, I think, negates that. But I want to get onto the reasons for this. I don't think there's any difference, or there's very little difference, between criticism of Israel and anti-Semitism. And the reason for that is that the enemies of the Jews don't make that distinction. If there's a war in Gaza, for example, it's Jews who get attacked, not Israelis. All Jews are tarred with the term Zionist, which has become a bad word. A peace settlement, I don't think, would end this. You could have a peace settlement, and I believe that the attacks would continue. Because history shows that even when there are no Jews, or they're behaving themselves well, they still become a symbol for hate. Then there's the double standards, the singling out of Israel for criticism and uh, examination that no other country gets. A movement called anti-Zionism. There's no movement called anti-Syrianism or anti-Muslim domination of women anti-Egyptism, anti-Saudi Arabia, nothing like that at all. It's discriminatory. For example, the fence, I'd be quick, I know. Did you know there's an Indian-Bangladeshi barrier? 2,500 miles, 1,000 Bangladeshis have been shot and killed since 2000 trying to cross. And there are other examples. The House of Lords, where I sit. More debates on Israel than on any other foreign issue. Last year, one peer asked 88 questions about Israel and a bishop, 22. There were 200 questions about Israel, 25 questions about Egypt. And in earlier years, it's been even more stark. I conclude that this is age-old anti-Semitism, which is connected with the disillusionment of the left who lost the causes that they were fighting for, and is connected with the Islamist agenda and the flow of Arab funds and the dependence on oil. Now, one doesn't know where to start, really. Israel, the reasons. Israel has been bad at PR, has relied on military strength. The left lost their belief in communism. They were blind. They finally had the scale stripped from their eyes. They looked for another cause, and that all happened in the late <coughs> 60s, just when Israel was fighting. There's terrific fear of Muslim reprisal. If you express too much support for Israel, there are two million Muslim voters in this country. Uh, the burgeoning of NGOs that get a lot of money in order to attack Israel and find a, a development there. Then there's the fundamentalist Muslim agenda that wants to reject the West and all its values. And they see the success of Israel as an insult to Islam and the way that it's lagged behind in every field for the last few hundred years. And of course the continuation of Jewish existence and Israel's success is anathema. Oil and oil prices, Israel can be blamed for that. Guilt about the Holocaust, as I mentioned. Is there still anti-Semitism? Well, there certainly is. And, of course, it gets absorbed in education and in churches. We need to fight that to make it clear. We need to stand up to the churches. Why aren't they speaking up about persecution of Christians in the Middle East? And we have to expose how people can be blind to dictatorship. Perez said on the 60th anniversary of Israel, look how things have changed in 60 years, we have a black president. 60 years from now, I hope that people will say, who could have imagined that Israel was being attacked for its success and that anti-Semitism was resurgent? Thank you very much.
already there's a lot of uh, ideas um, I want to discuss with you, so I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, now, uh, over to you, Paul, please. Okay, th thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I just want to confirm one of Bruce's points. In the House of Lords, for example, since I've been there, we've had seven long set-piece debates on Israel, we essentially focused on criticism of Israel. One in the same period on China, one in the same period on Latin America, these unimportant places. And the first point that tells you about it is that a lot of the debate about Israel is self-referential. It's about, it, 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 you will have to look at the culture of the people, uh, and, it's, and it's not quite so, obviously in objective importance, China far outweighs Israel, obviously, obviously. Um, but it doesn't happen, or it's not reflected in the debate. Uh, and in the things that we choose to have lengthy debates on. Um, why is that? Now, there was never a golden age for Israel, or, 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 but, there, but there have been important changes. Never a golden age because in England, anti-Semitism actually is, or historically was, if you look at the literary culture of the 30s and 40s, the racism of the middle classes. It could no longer be expressed in an age where we all accept the thoughts of multiculturalism in the same way. And I would also say something just to slightly qualify Ruth's argument about Britain, which I accept. Actually, I'm not sure in terms of the broad mass of the people that there is a problem particularly that singles Britain from any other European country in this respect. But in terms of certain types of elite, especially in the media and politics, uh, certain parts of academia, there is a particular problem precisely as she identifies. Now, why has this happened? Uh, now, I think one thing that just has to be acknowledged is that the collapse of socialism is a major, major, under, under the, the old left ideals of the 40s, 50s, even the early 60s, and way of thinking about the world has, a, has actually been hugely negative for its impact on uh, Israel, uh, uh, on, the, on the international perception of Israel. Um, you, it requires an effort to recall the crucial importance of that United Nations vote of the Soviet Union for the establishment of the State of Israel, and for some period of time people genuinely doubted in which bloc would Israel be most aligned. Um, Israel politics dominated by the Labour Party, and the discourse of scientific socialism, economic progress, in which the Palestinians could share in, is fundamentally, uh, for the British left, a hook which was fundamentally positive from Israel's point of view. With the transformation of that, both in, in this country, uh, with the emergence of a different type of left, where the icons and objectives are cultural, and nobody talks about nationalizing the commanding acts of the economy, etc., etc. So the change here, and also the change in Israel, where the politics now, the, the Labour Party is so much weaker than it was that in the early life of the Israeli state, that, that there's a, what one has then is a new left, and the issue there is the cultural theme of colonialism, even the fact that Israel might be seen as a product of the existence of one of the last acts of British imperial colonial deal-making of a sort of which we are now all apparently ashamed. Not dissimilar in, in many respects, the issue with respect to Northern Ireland. There's no particular curiosity about Palestinians. It's one of the things I find most surprising in our sports. When one talks about, say, the more positive figures for the Palestinian experience, i.e., for example, the very significant numbers of Palestinians now uh, uh, in Israeli who are now working in the, who are now receiving medical education, a very good indicator of possible opportunity in the society. Nobody's actually interested. When you talk about some of the ambiguous polling which shows about opinions uh, in that group, nobody is actually interested. I remember the last time I was in Israel, and was, uh, um, talking to students, and, uh, which included uh, 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 a mixed group of students at Haifa, and uh, at the time, Abinajab was talking about nuking Israel. And of course, what the non-Jewish students were saying, thank you very much for that. I mean, you know, and that's, but that's, that's an extreme example of not actually how the crucial thing is not the actual experience or how the, 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 the Arab minority in Israel were found that attack. The extreme example is the focus is negative on Israel as seen as the guilty imperialist uh, penetration of, of, of the region. And, and now that we have a left which cannot now empathize with Israel as it once did, that it's bringing progress to the region uh, in the way that it did in the 40s and 50s, 
the only thing that then you get is a sort of article in the London Review of Books to which you referred. So there is a, a major, it's a transformation both in Israeli politics interacting with a transformation in our politics, which has created this cultural demonization of the state of Israel and this focus on Israel as in terms of the history of imperialism, colonialism, uh, and I think that's really an important clue to why we actually have such current attitudes. Because I think it's like a, that, that Danny Finkelstein wrote some about a year ago in his column where he talked about his grandfather, two grandfathers. One was a red, and one said the solution to our problems is socialist society, and then the Jews don't have to worry. With equality, liberty for all men, that's a solution. The other was a Zionist. And the, 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 who's our solution is we must set up the state Israel and so on. Uh, and the two, he called his two, his two grandfathers arguing. And one said to the other, um, well, this will not work because socialism will not work. It is not a practical idea. It's a very fine idea. It will not happen. Uh, um, but but the, the socialist said to Zionists, yes, but the Arabs are a prime people. They will not allow you to have this project. You are living in an illusion. You will not be left in peace. No, and Finkelstein said rightly that both those arguments are actually powerful, powerful arguments and, and, re and reflect the grim reality of, 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 the, of the situation that actually uh, faces, faces the state of Israel. But what is quite remarkable about our discussion in the West is that 20 or 30 years ago, to conclude at this point, I remember the new lecture review that came out just after the Six Day War. That assumption is critical. That article is critical. The material there is critical of Israel, but it's still based on the idea that there is some socialist path in the Middle East in which all ethnicities can be rec reconciled in some simple way on the basis of the socialist project. Now, nobody believes in the socialist project anymore. Nobody, even at ULAP Review, believes in the socialist project anymore as a way out of the problems of the region. But New Left Review is as bitterly anti-Israel now as it was in the year or so after the Six Day War. Thank you very much, Paul. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, thanks, Adam. <coughs> uh, what I want to focus on, since I've only got a few minutes, is the question of why. You know, why is it that Israel is being pathologized? Why is it that it's being singled out as an apartheid state, a rogue state, a terrorist state, or as uh, Ben Dror alluded to most preposterously, uh, a modern day Nazi state, which is what some people are saying. Why is this happening? And to anticipate my argument, it's really that it's got caught up in someone else's culture war. It's something other speakers have alluded to in passing. It seems to me it's really to do with what you could loosely call the left, although that term isn't really ideal uh, anymore. They don't have any kind of positive sense of socialism, progress, economic growth, social change, which is what they used to believe in. So they define themselves negatively in terms of what they don't like. You know, they don't like old-fashioned nationalism. They don't like uh, old-fashioned militarism. They don't like uh, colonialism, as represented by the settlers of the West Bank and so on. So it's very much a way of the left more generally to say, well, we are good people because we're against these things. Oh, and by the way, we like the Palestinians too, not because we support freedom, but because we really like victimhood. We kind of like them wallowing in their victimhood. That's really why Israel has become such a, a big issue, I would argue. Now, that doesn't mean to say that I don't think there is a big problem with Palestinian rights, or lack of Palestinian rights inside Israel. Uh, I haven't got time to go into it, but I think it is the case that if you set yourself up as a Jewish state, and you have a significant non-Jewish minority, then that does create problems, even if you do have, as another speaker said, it's absolutely true to say you have Palestinian doctors and so on, uh, and it does define itself as democratic. There's all sorts of tensions between defining yourself as a Jewish state and a, a democratic state, and having a large Palestinian minority, never mind the West Bank of Gaza. So they are real problems, although they have to be put in their proper context. Having said that, I would also absolutely agree with Ben Dror's point about double standards, because there are completely ludicrous double standards. And here, I wouldn't focus so much on the Arab regimes or the Bangladesh example, but focus on the West. You know, people talk about their security wall running through the West Bank, which to my mind is a complete abomination. Uh, but
But what about Fortress Europe? You know, there's a huge physical and kind of police wall around Europe. You know, we saw recently 300 refugees drowning off Lampedusa uh, trying to get into Europe. Uh, it's estimated about 20,000 uh, refugees have died in a similar manner since 1988. And yet not only is it not discussed in the same way as the, the wall, in, when in fact it's on a much larger scale than the wall, but a lot of people, including these so-called leftists, see the EU as a solution. They want the EU to come in and put pressure on Israel to have some kind of solution to the Palestinian conflict. I mean, how ludicrous is that? The kind of bastion of you know, anti-democracy, the EU. Uh, bringing some kind of peace and democracy to the Middle East. Utterly ludicrous. And I think that very much bears on my main point, that you have a left that's completely lost its way, doesn't know what it stands for, so very much just kind of looking around, and it sees Israel as a kind of reminder of its past. You know, it used to, in the olden days, or large sections of the left, anyway, not all of them, uh, supported colonialism, now they see that the kind of settlers, you know, kind of say complete you know, fanatics and crazy people. So that's one reason to, to kind of single out Israel. Uh, they see Israel as being very strongly nationalistic and militarist, although even this, if you really know about Israeli society, this is a bit misleading uh, of a way to understand it. So they kind of single out Israel for very one-sided criticism. I wouldn't say so much lies. I mean, yeah, sometimes there are lies. But it's much more that uh, it's wrenched out of any kind of broader context, not really seeing the broader context of what's going on uh, to really understand what's happening. It is true that in America in particular, uh, although to some extent in Europe, you do also get some supporters of Israel who also put, I would say, unbearable burdens on uh, Israel and the Palestinians. So if you take America as an example, typically, it's supporters of American exceptionalism who think America has a special role to play in the world and you know, America should intervene more in the world and America should be more uh, nationalistic and America should be stronger. Typically, if you look at opinion polls of America and so on, it's those people who support Israel. So you have, to the extent you have supporters of Israel, very often they're supporting Israel because they see it more broadly reflecting their worldview. Uh, in the same way as you have the left, in a very grotesque way, uh, seeing Israel as a kind of bizarre reflection of their, their worldview in terms of they like victimhood, they don't like old-fashioned nationalism, colonialism, militarism, and so on. Uh, and I would say, th this kind of being caught in this giant cultural war, which isn't really to do with Israel and the Palestinians, is really too much for the people in the region to bear. Uh, I mean, I would say very much, you know, I certainly want there to be peace in the region, I certainly want there to be more democratic rights for the Palestinians. Uh, but I think the way to achieve that is really for the, the West and you know, Western radicals, Western conservatives, just to butt out. You know, if they want to criticise uh, democracy uh, or if they want to have their debates, then let them, have, let them have them within their own countries. If people in Europe want to criticise walls and arbitrary arrests and discrimination, plenty of examples in, in, in the EU and in Britain, of course, to do that as well. Just leave the Israelis and Palestinians alone to sort out their own conflict. That's really the, the main message that would come from my speech. Well, a number of really uh, interesting points. And uh, it was interesting when putting the actual debate uh, together, the panel, there was, uh, I spoke to a few different people, and there was kind of real concern, actually, of even participating in a, in a discussion and a debate like this. And I think it speaks to the point that uh, much of the discussion has become very shrill uh, and often emptied out, as some of the speakers have alluded to, of, of uh, politics and become much more about just personal identification uh, and uh, emotionalism. But um, if I can, I'd like to um, uh, address a point that everybody uh, has, has talked about in one way or another, which is that the, the end of uh, some of the ideas that were prevalent in society, some left-wing ideas and... and, and that type of thing. And then this discussion of a, a toxification, I think you, Ben Draw, when you were talking about you know, uh, what you called an industry of lies, but it's almost like a toxification of the discussion uh, of, of Israel and the situation. Uh, I, I'm interested in wondering, uh, you know, Daniel says that, people, that, that the West should just butt out. 
But is there a way that uh, a, a discussion can be had in a rational way uh, without those old ideas that actually uh, addresses the reality of the situation? Yes, I think. Uh, yeah, I do think that uh, uh, maybe we need, we in the Middle East, when I say we, I mean uh, Palestinians and Israelis, yes, we need a kind of uh, intervention. I'm not against it. What I'm saying is that the kind of intervention, uh, intervention that we are facing now is counterproductive to this. <coughs> because I, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Generally speaking, we know what are the guidelines of the peace agreement. It will be about clean to parameters, politically unsupported, and those who don't know what are the clean to parameters is to states or to people's right of return of Palestinians to the Palestinian state. Two states for two peoples. Now, instead of to push the both sides to that kind of agreement, by the way that it was accepted by the Arab world at the end of 2000, at the beginning of 2001, it was accepted. I don't want to go now to details about this process. We don't have all the time. It was accepted. Now, what happened in the last 13 years, since when it was proposed? So many academics, so many journalists, and I'm speaking about the two biggest uh, 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 bodies of information, media and academia. They are pushing the Palestinians to the other side. They are propos promoting what? The right of return. Not the right of return, the legitimate one, to the Palestinian state, but the right of return on the expense of Israel. It did not happen to more than 50 million people. How comes it you ask something of that kind for Israel? So, yes, <coughs> the West, the free world, can have a positive role in pushing both sides to a decent and fair solution. But it is not done. What you see is, um, uh, unfortunately, in London and Paris, you see demonstrations of left-wingers with uh, uh, Nasrallah, who is totally anti-Semite. And what you see, you see this kind of flotillas that are coming to support the Hamas. And what is the Hamas, to those of you who don't know? And sometimes it's misinformation. The Hamas is broadcasting something like, listen carefully, we have to kill the Jews. Well, it's fair enough, you know, Jews, they should be killed. We should kill the communists. We should kill the Christians. They are speaking about London, but you ignore it because of the phenomena of wishful ignorance. Enough. Okay, if so you want to promote peace, let's go for it. Okay, but so not with wishful ignorance. I'm going to hold you there. On, that, on the notion of, and you talked a lot about it, um, Ruth, on the notion of uh, the sort of things that are said uh, and the discourse now in terms of poisoning everything, that uh, basically there's a convergence with the notions of Zionism and Judaism and the Jews poison and make everything toxic. I mean, it was the case just historically that some Zionists did say also that if you criticise uh, Zionism and the State of Israel, that necessarily meant uh, you were anti-Semitic as well. But there definitely has been a sea change. Uh, and, and to this point, I, one of the things uh, I think many people have noticed is that if you go on a demonstration, uh, or you know, um, uh, students or elsewhere on both sides of the Atlantic, the sort of things that, um, are, that are said end up not being so much political, it seems, but much more about some innate, inherent trends of, of people. Do you think there's a way to address that and, and rectify it? Mm. I think you have to keep on pointing out the double standards. Um, for example, though this isn't really a major example, whenever there is an atrocity in London, take the beheading of that unfortunate soldier in South London, or the bombings in the Kenyan Mall, the politicians rush forward to say, this has nothing to do with Islam, Islam is a religion of peace, it's an aberration. But if something unfortunate happens in Gaza, or uh, Israel uh, defends that, that Turkish so-called uh, activist vote, then it's the fault of all of Israel, it's the fault of all Jews. People take that as axiomatic. The politicians don't rush forward to say that this has got nothing to do with Judaism, this is a localised dispute. 
And then I think the churches, all of them, have a lot to answer for. Um, being on the House of Lords email, I get lots of unsolicited emails from all sorts of organisations. And particularly bad are the Methodists, who put out stuff about how dare the Jews think they're the chosen people. I mean, we don't call ourselves the chosen people. That's an insult that others like to use in order to create double standards. The churches are putting out a load of stuff at the moment about Palestine. Something came around the other day from an email called church and society, a, a view of Palestine. And the bishops, um, nothing about Christians in the Middle East. No one seems to be remotely interested in the fact that Syria has made probably more Palestinian refugees in the last couple of years than ever Israel did. Or that Palestinian refugees living in Lebanon are not allowed to go to higher education can't have a vote, can't work in certain professions. Nobody said anything about that. Or that Jews will never be allowed to live in the new Palestine if it ever comes about. I mean, if you want to use the word apartheid, there it is. I think the church has a great deal to answer for. And I personally no longer want to get involved in these uh, you know, Christian-Jewish dialogues and so on. I think there's a great deal of heart searching that needs uh, to be done there. But also, I think we are a non-interventionist society for not intervening in Syria. I don't see why Britain should be called on to intervene anywhere else in the Middle East. I agree with Daniel. Butt out. I think that's right. Well, on that note of butting out, well, I'm interested to hear what you think, because it does seem that uh, many, from many quarters, uh, there is the claim that um, other people should sort out the problems. And, and historically, uh, Israel has played a role in the region. Um, what do you think about that idea of just butting out and, and letting people get on with uh, the situation in their region themselves? Well, I'm, I'm inevitably influenced by my own Irish background and the whole business of the Good Friday Agreement. I actually do not, on the whole, favour butting out, and I'll explain why I was actually agree uh, with what's just been said immediately on my left, because the, what, it, what matters is the nature of the intervention on the right side. And to put this very simply, Tony Blair and I are much despised by all those people who voted for him and in droves before and all of that and put their careers on his back. But the much despised Tony Blair did uh, one reason why he had success against the odds we now forget in, 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 in terms of uh, the Good Friday Agreement was that he went against the impulses of a large part of his party, which was naturally sympathetic to it. A, a nationalist worldview emotionally. Claire Short, whom you mentioned, being a classic person in this respect, having roughly the same views, uh, you know, the same mindset with respect to Northern Ireland as with respect to uh, the Middle East, and went precisely against those views and saw that actually, if you want to persuade people to make painful compromises, you have actually got to show that you understand what their fundamental rights of self determination are. I think that's the fundamental well, approach. That's why eventually he got a balanced deal, and whatever of subsequent mistakes of judgment and so on uh, characterized by his career, the fact of the matter is he did understand the absolute fundamental elements. And I think that that is what we, that it's that type of approach in the Middle East could actually be uh, relatively effective. But I, I mean, the truth of the matter is. That the point has been well made already. We all know roughly where the two-state solution deal, the outlines of that, what, what it, what's possible and what's not. And intellectual fashions come and go. And for example, the intellectual fashion went completely against the idea of the power sharing plus Irish dimension deal, not operative in, in North Ireland. For 10 years, academics wrote books saying, we used to talk about that in the 70s, it's ridiculous, we can't have it anymore. And it's actually what happened because there's no alternative. The same thing applies to the two-state solution. That's why it has a viability, because there actually is an alternative. Even though there are moods of opinion and people suddenly talk about the latest development, which means I once believed in that, it's not that possible. The truth is it always comes back to the same thing. And it does, even in Northern Ireland, it wasn't just Blair, it did depend, of course, principally on the local forces to do the deal. Okay, thank you. I, I'm going to come to Daniel, but I want to see a, a show of hands of people who are going to want to speak and contribute. Um, Daniel, I, I, so you say maybe the West should butt out and, and these... Well, not maybe. Okay, they should, they should butt out, yeah. Uh, and you say that it, it, Israel finds itself, and the Palestinians caught in this culture war. 
Mm. I'm wondering in this discussion about how it, it's almost presented as it's immutable, that there, there's this, this toxic thing there that's not susceptible to change. Is there a possibility that you can have a discussion outside of, of the region that still informs it with some a bit more inspiring idea about the future? Is, is that possible too? Uh, I think it, it's possible, but it's, it's very <coughs> difficult because you've got to cut through this huge kind of culture war that, that's going on. So in fact, although in a way it's true that there's a huge discussion of Israel, I'm going to take a point on that, uh, in a way it's not true because they're kind of discussing caricatures. They don't really understand what's really going on. It's a kind of bizarre discussion which is completely ill-informed and doesn't have any bearing on reality. And in relation to that, I wanted to give an example of apartheid in, in the areas controlled by Israel. Because there is a kind of, a, something a bit akin to apartheid, but it's not, it's not what people generally think. Because it's now coming up to the 20th anniversary of the Oslo Accords, which are kind of Western brokered accords between uh, the Israeli government and the Palestinian leadership. And what's not really understood there is that the, the, uh, since the Oslo Accords, the West Bank has, uh, has no longer existed. People don't really understand this, but if they look at the reality, that, that this is the case. Because uh, for the last 20 years, uh, since the, this kind of peace agreement came into effect, the West Bank has been divided into these three different kinds of areas, area A, B, and C. So, one area is uh, Palestinians and it's under Palestinian authority control. One area is mainly populated by Palestinians but is under Israeli control. And one area is mainly the settlers uh, and it's under Israeli control as well. And these are not like three distinct areas. It's a kind of patchwork that exists in the West Bank. You have some, some are in area A, some are in area B, some in area C. So whereas, you know, the West Bank, I, I travelled around the West Bank in this period, the West Bank between you know, 1967 and 92, you know, there was Israeli roadblocks and it was kind of diff a bit difficult to travel around. Now, it's become much more divided up, uh, mm -hmm. much more segmented, precisely as a result of Western intervention. So to the extent you can talk about apartheid, in, in many cases the people don't understand apartheid at the start, uh, let alone what's going on uh, in Israel. But to the extent you can see something akin to it, it's very much the result of Western intervention in the region. So I would argue very, very strongly against it on all counts. There's no maybe at all in that respect in my argument. Okay, so we're going to start on this side with a microphone. We've got a gentleman at the front here, and we're going to work our way back. We're going to take a range uh, of things, and then I'll come back to the panel. Uh, thank you, first of all, for this uh, interesting intervention or presentations that we did. And I have certain comments, very, very short, uh, think about the mortality of the influence of the Palestinians that, that Mr. Yemeni started. If we look at the change, it started changing since the 80s, where the World Bank had started to take attention or to pay attention to Palestinians. But before that, when they were under Israeli control, what was the number? It was certainly high. This is the first thing. And we, when we talk about Hamas and their uh, all bad issues, and we are, we are all looking at, uh, at the negative uh, vision that they are presenting with their eyes, what they want to kill the Jews or whatsoever we talk about. But we do not want to forget that they were elected democratically in a, in a very bad situation, and the West refused completely to deal with them. If the, if the, the West does not want to deal with the democracy, then as you have uh, all said, they should be aside. I'm sorry about the. Uh, I'm sorry, just uh, quickly. Probably, yeah, and the the uh, the thing about uh, Islamists and wanting to kill the Jews, etc. Quran does not ask us to kill the Jews. Does not kill uh, ask us. Uh, Islam does not allow Muslims to kill anyone unless you attack them. However, when we talk about the Muslims getting attacked in their houses when we talk about Gaza and the, the attack against Gaza, it was really very high, very, very uh, difficult. And uh, to finish and to end up with this, we want the peace, Palestinians want the peace, but a just peace, not from the West, not from the Israelis, not from the Palestinians who are living now because they suffered and they don't want to finish it. I hope that once we get rid, um, I'm sorry, with this trip, when they die, 
those people who participated with these wars, we might get peace. Otherwise. Okay, thank you. So, directly behind you. Yes, well, I'm very sad to say that I don't see uh, recently that there's any hope of peace at all. Only this morning we heard on the news a few moderate Muslims who said that they don't want Muslims to commit murders and and all the terrorism and all the stories we hear. They've been threatened with death now, and our police have to have to uh, save them and, and guard them. So and who have we got to talk to? Okay, directly behind you. Yeah. Thank you. This is unusual in my experience of nine years coming back to ideas, that it hasn't been so much a debate as a very high quality chorus all speaking off the same hymn sheet. And I found that absolutely unique. And I wonder if that relates to what Ruth has said, which is that actually if you express any dissent or opposition, you're immediately branded an anti-Semite. That's the Melanie Phillips approach. And I'm very sorry that it's been, you know, in something like the SVA ideas that has been uh, mobilized. I have to say, one can criticize Israel and not have an anti-Semitic atom in one's body. And I hope people realize that. And I can give you more credentials, but I won't insult you. And then, so one needs to look at certain things. For example, the wall. There is absolutely no analogy between Fortress Europe, the wall between Bangladesh and India, and the wall that absolutely breaks up all everyday life in Palestine. It actually, in the way that Daniel, I think, has done it. So there isn't a simple analogy there. Secondly, some of the, the most recent uh, attack on Gaza looked from the outside like shooting fish in a barrel. So there was a, there was a serious problem. And you need to debate it. You mustn't shut down debate by saying it's anti-Semitic to say so. So I think it's very important that people say, we will listen to you without immediately saying that you're anti-Semitic. You've had a series of leaders in Israel, some of whom have been absolutely bloody awful, and some of whom have been bloody wonderful. I want to praise the ones that have been bloody wonderful and criticize the ones that have been bloody awful. It doesn't mean to say I'm anti-Semitic. OK, thank you. Yeah, the young lady with the stripes. Do you want to stand up? Um, or do you... um, in terms of butting out, do you think it's irresponsible of the international community or the West um, to do this? Is it was the UN who, in some ways, started the issue by interfering to form the state of Israel in the first place after World War II? And I'm going to take uh, one more just here, and then I'm going to come back to the panel, and I'm going to come back out. The gentleman there. You've been very good on, on generalities and occasional specifics about what they might be calling anti-Semitism, and I agree. But you haven't really dealt with the things that keep it rolling along. Let me give you two examples, a small one and a big one. The small one is Holocaust Memorial Day. I don't know much about it. When I first got to hear about it, my reaction was to it was, well, why am I being made to feel guilty about something my country's not involved in? And I thought, somebody's pressured some politicians to do this, and I don't like it. Uh, the second thing is, everybody knows that the Israel lobby was so important in dragging the Americans into the Iraq war. In fact, it was basically to protect Israel. They, and it dragged us into, and now they want to drag us into the war, in the war with Iran. This, and this influence is not talked about. I mean, it, 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 people who are against it could be said to be anti-Semitic because it involves Jews in Israel and involves Jews in America and in this country. Okay, I'm actually going to take a couple more as you go. Okay, so yeah, Frank Frey there, and then guy right behind him, and then I'm going to come back. Yeah, I mean, uh, historically, I'm, I'm going the other way around because uh, I've always been very critical of Israel and uh, made a number of criticisms about the, the way it fought the war. And, uh, and and to this day, I think that we have to recognize that there is a war going on there, and when a war is going on, um, people often do horrible things to each other. And there's no point in pretending that we have angels on one side and the devils on the other side. I mean, wars are wars. But I do think that something very important has changed. And I think what has changed is that there's been a, a very powerful, and it's got nothing to do with Israel, actually. I mean, Israel is the prism through which this is expressed. There's a very powerful cultural imperative which continually creates these fantasies uh, whereby people have this belief that something almost supernatural is associated with Israel and the Jews. I mean, you talked about the, this all-powerful, omnipotent Israeli lobby that can literally, you know, sort of manipulate the whole world into war. It's almost like, you know, sort of the protocols of the elders of Zion sitting around the table and they say, 
let's invade Iraq. No, 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 Iraq is a better place to invade. Let's, let's kind of do it like that. And, and people actually believe that there is this incredible. Well, that well, maybe in your fantasies, maybe in your fantasies, but in the real world, no. most, don't of, go, please. most American politicians are, are very calculating. You know, they know their real politics, they, they know what the score is. That's not how the world works. It is a lot. They're not actually having And it is. At the moment, so, I mean, I travel around Europe quite a bit. And one of the things that I'm really disturbed by is, is not that people criticize Israel, because I, I, I do have a good way to travel, so that you, know, you can criticize Israel, not be you know, anti Semitic. A lot of my friends don't like Israel, you know, they like Jews, and, and, and are quite capable of making those decisions. But something new is happening, which is you go around Europe, and because people don't know that I have any kind of Jewish affiliation or background, they talk very freely to me. And the language they use, and, and the kind of expressions that they, they kind of make, is really what would have been called classical anti-Semitism. At the moment, I'm involved in a debate uh, in many European countries about circumcision. As you, as, you, as you know, for example, all of a sudden, circumcision of, uh, of not just of Jewish, but of Muslim boys is now seen as a crime against children. It's, it's almost like a new Holocaust. You can't use the word Holocaust against babies and everything. And, and all of a sudden, People who can barely spell the word circumcision have got very strong views on that and, and believe that this is like, you know, destroys you know, the, the human way of life. Now, as a sociologist, I ask myself, why is it that in the 21st century, all of a sudden, throughout Europe, Scandinavia, Germany, Belgium, everything that circumcision is, is the issue to have a big debate about? You know, what is it? What is it? They have an economic crisis, mass unemployment, you have all these this, this, and yet this is the, the big issue of our time. You, Scratch the surface and you actually realize that at the end of the day, you know, sort of, you know, when the word Jew is involved in it, there's a kind of, what sneaks in is a, is a, is a different way of, of interpreting it. And I, and I do think that that exists. And I'm afraid that debate and discussion isn't going to really solve that problem. My own view is that if you are a, a person of the Enlightenment, if you believe in rationality and reason, if you believe in progress, it doesn't matter what your ethnic background is, You've got to stand up and be counted. I and mean, that's what I want to do. I want to be stand up and be counted. Because it's only people who yell back and shout back and argue and expose the stupidity to do with uh, this new uh, sort of anti semitic trend, which is really to do with the disorientation of European culture and European society. If people do that uh, much more vociferously, then you can expose. I and mean, I think what Ruth was saying is really important. The double standards in particular are really so important to bring out. Because it doesn't, you, know, you don't have to love Israel, you, know, you don't have to agree with them, but you know, anybody with a, with, a, with a brain cell in their head will know that this is a double standard on this issue. People are judging a particular group by standards that nobody else is judged by. And, you know, and we as rational reasoning people do have to uh, stand up and, and, and basically expose that as being hypocritical and ultimately dishonest. I'd rather have a, a, an honest, upfront anti Semite. You know, I can handle that, I can really deal with that. So, I hate the Jews, you know, they're crafty people, they do that. I, that's, that's, that's okay with me. But it's when you say, well, no, it's not really the Jews that I really hate, it's, you know, something else, you know, sort of that they're associated with. That becomes a much more insidious way of dealing with the issue. Thank you. And just directly behind you, uh, behind there, and then I'll come back to the panel. Um, yeah, I'd kind of like to uh, try and push the panel a bit on, on what they mean by when we say, you know, the, the West should butt out. And because at the same time uh, that we've had a lot of discussion um, about the, the pro-Palestinian um, left, there are also uh, a, a lot of Jewish community leaders um, who, who, instead of kind of engaging with um, the problems of assimilation in their communities, um, the, the problem of what it means to be a Jew in, in kind of Western Europe and, and America, have um, replaced that conversation um, with the imperative that Israel should be supported in exactly the same kind of um, cultural, uh, it, playing exactly the same kind of cultural um, that their opposition have, and and kind of extending that, um, I think the, the Western European Jewish community has some responsibility to take for disassociating the idea of the genocide um, from the Jews and from the Holocaust and applying it to horrible wars and situations in other places. Um, the Jewish community support of the declaration that, that you know, the Sudanese conflict was a genocide, I think is, is quite telling. Um, but in, in some sense, um, Jews in, in Europe, in, in projecting their aspirations onto Israel, 
have encouraged a charge of hypocrisy that's now being used against them. Thank you very much. Okay, so a number of uh, items that have come up there. Um, everything from Hamas being uh, elected democratically and the view of uh, Muslims and Jews to uh, some of the last points about the West coming out. I, who wants to speak first? <coughs> uh, ben Jordan. Yeah. Uh, first question about facts. Uh, you mentioned the infant mortality. Yes, between 80 and... Uh, if you go on, this... So are the facts. I mean, just what I presented in the papers that you still see. But, yes, there are data about what happened from 67 to 80. It's just unbelievable. Just unbelievable. Does I mean, it work, it, it's just unbelievable. I'm going to publish it. Well, I didn't come here with all my books. I'm going to publish a book about the industry of flies. And what happened to the Palestinians since 67 up to now, it is just unbelievable. I can give you uh, a lecture now of two hours. I'm not recommending uh, Israeli control, control. I'm not recommending occupation. But what happened to the Palestinians since 67 up to now is a kind of miracle. Not one university in 67. Not one university. Listen carefully. Right now they are, hey, they are having the highest rate, the highest rate of university graduates in the Arab world. I'm not recommending my people to tell me, wow, well, you are recommending uh, occupation. Not, I'm not. Anti-Semitism and criticism. Uh, completely right. Completely right. I don't think that every criticism against Israel. Israel is not perfect. Israel many times deserves criticism. I don't think that I'm anti-Semite. In my newspaper, you can read it also in English, I criticize again and again the policies of the Israeli government. I'm talking about lies. I'm not talking about criticism. And to say that Israel is a Nazi kind of state, a pariah state, that is committing a genocide, it's not criticism. Okay. Wait, no, no, I have, uh, sorry, sorry, I uh, have two, two, two more points. One more, one more. Okay, uh, only one uh, more point. Uh, that Israel dragged uh, the U.S. to the uh, Iraq war. Well, I know it's a kind of place. Arik Sharon, who was a prime minister in that time, was against any kind of intervention of uh, the U.S. Now, let me tell you something about the Jews in the United States. Yes, there are some neoconservatives. The majority of the Jews in the United States are liberals, a kind of what you might call here, leftists, and they are voicing themselves much more than the neoconservatives. Yes, that is a debate. I wish just one thing I wish, that there was a kind, the same kind of debate about everything in the Muslim community, in Britain, in Europe, in, among Jews. Yes, we have debates, but what are you doing? You, you turn it into a kind of Criticism is not allowed, it's anti-Semitism. It's the opposite. Just the opposite. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, in, in a sense, I think this question of criticism of Israel is very simple, because I think it's completely legitimate to criticise Israel, and there are lots of things it can justly be criticised for, but I think you have to apply the double standards test. Mm -hmm. So, if Israel denies Palestinians democratic rights, which I think it does in quite a few cases, and you can talk about them if you like, that's fine, you can criticise them for that. But, you've got to be prepared to criticise other states for doing the same thing. There's lots of examples in Britain where that happens. So, on that level, it's very simple. You, yeah, of course, it is, Israel can be criticised, but those criticisms have to be <coughs> properly contextualised. And I just want to come in on, I'm a great admirer of Ray Tallis at the front, who's very modest and really talk about his achievements, the guy with the, the stripy jacket. But, but I, I actually, sorry to describe you like that, but um, uh, I, I think you are wrong on this one because I think that if anything, the uh, fortress Europe, the wall around Europe is far, far worse than the uh, wall running through the West Bank, although that is certainly uh, pretty bad. Uh, I mean, even on a technical level, the other EU countries, uh, as you may know, they, they finance uh, huge fortifications along the Greek border to stop uh, Greek-Turkish border to stop people from the Middle East coming into Europe. So, you know, incredibly heavily fortified, fortified border. But also, it's on a, on a hugely, hugely larger scale. So, if anything, 
And there are lots of other examples of EU lack of democracy, if I'm just focusing here on the wall. If anything, it's even worse uh, than Israel, and yet it's not discussed in the same way at all. So yes, criticise Israel, but don't have double standards. Uh, and it, do you want to come back up, otherwise we'll... Democracy. Press. Well, um, I, do you want me to talk about democracy? Quickly, yeah. Yeah, democracy. I agree. About Hamas was elected democratic. But we see this right through the Middle East. There have been a number of so-called democratic elections in Middle Eastern countries recently. That's not democracy. Voting is the icing on the cake. But democracy, you need, first of all, free press, freedom for journalists, rights for women, a free society. You have to have that substructure. Otherwise, you have one vote and you never get to vote again. You need the infrastructure, and that is lacking through much of the Middle East. As far as community leaders, something I agree. Our Jewish community leaders are not what we want and need at this particular time. And it may be that they are lacking in the professional and intellectual standing that they ought to have to address these issues. I'm sorry to say that our Jewish community leaders have not, they've been self-appointed. They're not people that I and many others would support. I don't know where they come from. They're not speaking for us. And we need something quite different. But you try and criticize them. Oh boy, to get shot down. Okay. Uh, Paul? Um, just very briefly, um, I totally accept the point that one criticised Israel and not the anti Semitic. Recently, Tom Carew, who was one of the leading figures in defence of Israel in, in Irish public life, in a very, a very isolated position, went to Israel, saw actions of the Israeli Defence Forces, which he considered to be high handed and aggressive, and <coughs> said so. And I absolutely, it's impossible to argue. That Tom Carew, who in a culture now much more hostile to Israel, and Ireland's foreign policy much more hostile to Israel than, uh, uh, than Britain. Uh, and the polling shows, for example, recently in the Sunday Independent, large chunks of Irish people saying, I would be reluctant to welcome the Jew into my own home because of the policies of Israel. And that's the other, the other point I want to make about this is that. I actually do think that public debate in this country is actually better than that, more open. Uh, and it's not it, quite to, to that degree uh, 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 negative from the, from the point of view of, of, of Israel. I really do think there's a difference between certain sections of the commentariat and what actually the broad mass of British people think on these issues. And nearly all the polling, reactions to conflicts, to individual conflicts, uh, uh, as they occur in the Middle East, suggests a much more complicated and variegated attitude among the broad mass of British people on this question. Uh, a generally divided attitude, but by no means one uh, that is set in one way or another. Okay, can I see your hands again, please? A lot, a lot more hands. I'm coming over to this side first, and uh, then we're going to go back. So, there we go. Hi, and this is kind of half comment, half question. Firstly, everyone's on the panel is talking as if this is a symmetrical conflict, which is not. We're not talking about conflict, we're talking about occupation. And you've got the world's fourth strongest military and Palestinians. So we're not talking about an equal conflict, firstly. Secondly, I'd be interested to know where the Palestinian voice in this debate is, because, like someone touched on before, is everyone's arguing the same thing. And at the end of the day, there's a certain amount of hypocrisy because you're acting as if it's only Israel that suffers from this misrep misrepresentation. And the fact of the matter is that the Palestinians also suffer hugely from this. The whole conflict is misrepresented. Um, the Palestinians are also hugely generalised, which is something, while you're talking about not generalising about Israelis and about Israel, kind of, I've heard quite a few sweeping statements about Palestinians, about Gaza, about, and that's also a problem. Um, so I just wondered what you might think about that. Thank you. <laughs> Lady in the blue shirt there. Yeah, I completely agree with everything that you just said, and then to add on to that, Ruth, just because it's not your form of democracy doesn't mean it is not democracy. Good, thank you. Um, there's a woman with a red shirt in the corner. Yeah. Um, hi. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I mean, I, I've just come over from South Africa where the BDSM movement is sort of quite uh, big, and um, the people I find who are actually shutting down debate isn't so much 
the uh, people who say you can't criticize Israel if they are anti-Zionist or whatever. It's, it's the people like the BDSM movement, the sort of the radical left student movement, who you know are banning uh, Israelis from coming, academics coming over, um, trying to ban, ban musicians and, and all that sort of thing. You know, they're the ones shutting down debate. I mean, Israelis may disagree or, or, or say. Um, you know, to criticise Israel is, is to be anti-Semitic, but they're not actually shutting down debate, they're prepared to argue the point around it. So that's one thing. The other thing that I find really obnoxious is the sort of lazy um, characterisation of Israel as an apartheid state. And, um, you know, because there's nothing within the Israeli constitution that denies democratic, that enshrines the denial of democratic rights. Um, if de the denial of democratic rights happens ad hoc, as you know, the, the restriction of movement and stuff, it's, it, it's always been a response to their threat of security, um, and obviously it should be you know challenged and, and, and criticised. But it's not an apartheid state, and um, um, that's another way of trying to sort of shut down debate, but also very much reflects the defence defensiveness of, of, of the left um, and radicals in South Africa now who, who you know, have nothing else to criticise since their revolutionary so-called party is now exposed as an elitist, anti-mass um, uh, party that it always was. And, and, and so this has become their new you know, um, thing to go on about. Okay, can we just come to the front here to Ruth Saunders and then we're going to go carry on back up that side, then I'll come over to you. Um, just in, in uh, defence of the Institute of Ideas, just to tell you that there was supposed to be an opposing view on the panel, but that person pulled out when they found out the Anglo-Israel Association was one of the supporters of this event. Okay, heading back up here, there's a gentleman there. No, just there, and then we'll come to him next. There we go. Um, well, I was minding my own business in uh, Lebanon recently, and um, I think I got a... Uh, I, I went up to the Palestinian energy minister who liked my talk and I said I'm 110% behind the Palestinians although my dad was Jewish and he said there's no contradiction there and uh, I'm still 110% behind the Palestinians and I vigorously oppose the occupation and the occupation is a fact it's completely anti-democratic but I think what we need to recognise is that there's something new in this, which is not just to do with the occupation of the Six Day War, it's something a contemporary development in the last few years, which is the self-loathing of the West is projected onto Israel. If you look at us in the West, we don't like sugary drinks, we're all obese, we can't go fracking, we can't have high-speed train too, we can't have anything really, we don't like ourselves much, uh, except we do like celebrities, but we feel guilty about that. So, uh, you know, you take all of these things, so what, what can we really get our rocks off and all agree on? And, and find there's an absolute moral standard that's new for 2013, quite different from 67, is hating Israel. So, you know, you can be completely hateful of the occupation, as I am, and a supporter of Palestinians for 40 years, but you need to recognize what's new. And this is what, where I think the man in the stripy blazer <laughs> and the stripy tie is wrong to say, to detect the unanimity on the, on the platform, because I think what Daniel is drawing attention to is the fact that all of this is about the identity of liberals, the London Review of Books, and all of that in the West. It's not about Israel, it's not about Palestine, no? it's about <coughs> us. Exactly. How selfish exactly. can you get? And I just want to end by saying, I, I do think we need to discuss butting out of it, because at this Lebanese mm -hmm. conference on energy, the people calling all the shots, I thought it would be the French, it turns out to be the Germans. The Germans <laughs> are going down there and saying, don't have a proper energy supply, just don't use any energy, you know. And the guy who did this, the lights went out during his speech. <laughs> um, and, you know, so it's not just that they're trying to carve up a, a bad solution for the Palestinians. It's not just that they're, they project their self-loathing and say Israel is shit, right? But they're also in there at the level of, let's not have anything more than solar water heaters so Palestinians can have a hot shower, but don't give them any electricity either. That's what the EU is doing down there. I and mean, it would do it in Palestine, just as much as it's doing in Lebanon. So Daniel, may, can we come back? How do I get rid of these Germans at these Lebanese uh, energy conferences? <laughs> Thank you, there's a young man with a blue sweater. Um, following on from this West-centric idea, um, 
you've touched on the ignorance uh, in the West, especially in this country, about Israel um, and the uh, double standards. And I wondered if, um, if you would just touch on education, because in my university, um, I, I'm in the Jewish society, but we're not a political society. We just meet up for drinks and to have fun. We're progressive. We're very, um, we we sympathise with the Palestinians, but we're not political. But then the Palestine, the Palestine society is made up mostly, I have to say, of white middle class um, um, uh, sons and daughters of very um, affluent middle class families. They say they're progressive. They say we're left wing. They say uh, we're, you know, we're we're very pro -pal pro Palestine. Um, but they look at us and say, hey, do you want to debate because you're the Jewish society? Um, expecting us to be some ardent supporters of Zionism. So, sure, so I would ask you, does the um, problem in this country lie with a deficiency in our education system? Is there an ignorance there? Okay, thank you for some really good points coming out there. And yeah, in the, there's a gentleman with a hat on, and then next to him there. Okay, I'm aware that a lot of what I say will sound like Greek to many people. I'll sit if that's okay. You stand up. I'll sit if that's okay. okay. Uh, I'm aware that it will sound like Greek. Well, you may want to sit. I am a bit deaf. I won't hear what you say as you stand up. You can't hear clearly. So. Speak, sorry, I think that when I stand up, that will increase the volume of my voice. Yeah. yeah. Do yeah. that. Yeah. 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 You're always. It helps lip reading. It helps lip reading. <laughs> so. I'm aware that what I say might sound like many of you, many of you like if we Greek, but um, I think that it's actually hugely illustrative that there is a panel of you, a single chorus, and some incredibly uh, professionally produced glossy literature. And I think that's a, a great illustration, really, of uh, really what goes on here. It's interesting uh, that you know clever Jews so well organized and so vocal. And I think that that reminds me, I think it must, of actually how it is that Israel was founded. Uh, Israel was the only voice that was listened to by the British government. The Jews were just better organized. They had a far stronger lobby. Arab interests were not considered in the formation of the uh, Israeli, Israeli state. The, the question here is, how did, how did this happen? How did the world come to this? Uh, how did this dichotomy uh, occur? Well, it turns out that the, the answer is in the middle of your glossy brochure. Until you understand this, you really want to understand what's, what's going on. So, I was very interested in Ruth's comments about uh, how it is that uh, there's a kind of Jewish primacy in the world, and it attracts a good degree of jealousy. How did this happen? How is it that 26% of all the Nobel Prizes ever given in science and, and chemistry and, and engineering and so on have been won by Ashkenazi Jews. Why is it the Jews dominate uh, entertainment, law, business, and so on? It may be the case, and there's a good degree of evidence to suggest that the Ashkenazi uh, advantage in IQ is the product of centuries of religious persecution, where unless you were intellectually gifted, unless you were wily, it was very difficult to survive in Europe. And so it is that it may be that when the Arab world looks around and sees an Israel which is able to produce glossy brochures, run a very successful economy, around the world this primacy in Jewish intelligence, creativity, and intellectual achievement attracts not a theory of, okay, these people have some kind of advantage. The only explanation which makes sense is there must be a conspiracy here. This can't be genes, this can't be culture, there must be a Jewish violence conspiracy in the background. And so interestingly, the problem is created originally by religious persecution and then sustained in a religious myth that there is, you know, we haven't created this yeah, group of wily intellectual people. You know, it must be that this is an original biblical conspiracy, a religious conspiracy, and not just the tenor of the conversation around the room has the same kind of unopinion rationality. Okay, thank you for highlighting and representing some of the trends I think we're discussing. Um, okay, so there's a gentleman directly next to you, or just along the, the row, and then I'm going to come over to that. We're going to carry on with this till I bring the panel in. So if you want to speak, it's going to be your last opportunity. Yes. Um, just we've got the benefit of having a professor Paul, Paul uh, view here, and often the analogy of Israel, peace of Israel, was made for the peace, peace of Northern Ireland. Um, just a, a comment on if you could just we could have a, explore that in a little way. But when Daniel says about butting out, 
um, and, and, and the West not interfering. I think, and I don't think the North either, but from, from my standpoint, you know, that, that, that piece was broken by the Americans and uh, the EU and well, the Americans are coming in. But it seems to be sort of entrenched uh, sectarianism in Northern Ireland, you know, about marches and the whole democratic process um, in the North of Ireland is entrenched around the political parties just representing Catholics in Northern Ireland or just representing loyalists. So I would, in a sense, be very cautious about the West in, uh, have it, trying to broker peace um, in this way. So if you've got a view on uh, that analogy about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, heading across, there's a guy in the green sweater, yes. Uh, well, presuming there isn't this kind of massive global conspiracy, uh, I think most people would agree that the benefit of the whole region and the whole world is to have a peaceful solution. So uh, I'm doing a project that's cool on actually about how likely it will be to have a solution. So I'd just like your thoughts really. Are we ever likely to see a two-state solution? And if not, what else may there be to lead to this coexistence and peace we'd all like to see? Okay, thank you. Yes, of course, on the end of the road there. I, I just wanted to say coming from Germany, it's very funny to hear a um, comment about the Jews and uh, you know, Donkey King, because I thought actually it's the Germans who are dominating the world, and I, I think Germans are quite right. You know, Germans are exporting their green ideology all over the world. Germans have started to uh, interfere in circums circumcision. Uh, it was the German court which uh, made that decision, which you know, kicked up the whole debate. It started in Scandinavia, but Germany was the first country. Germany is trying to impose its European policies over Europe. So why are you saying it's the Jews? You know, it's the same old question. It must be the Germans. And I think both is quite similar. Both, uh, both, both, both answers are very simple. And I think we just need to see that the world is much, much more complex. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm a little, well, I guess it's okay, that's one of my points. And that's the point you said about the um, barrier between Europe and you know, what we have. It isn't rough, quite the same thing, because until you get you know, a proper Palestinian state, technically Israel and Palestine is still the same nation. And it's generally you know, a bit off to um, build a wall between two sides of your country when you're in the same country. So I think there's a slight difference there. I'm on a pure base of principle. But the second place I'd like to ask, I'm coming from a Jewish perspective as myself, as we often have this sort of debate in our synagogue, um, that um, often the policies of Israel, and you know, they haven't really touched on what the internal perspective is, um, are often, you know, people find it both um, um, self destructive in a way, and almost the Israeli policy, you know, based on dark Zionism, is not a particularly good one for the future of Israel and sustainable peace. But um, if you take the example of lots of the groups you mentioned, you know, Hamas and Hezbollah, why did Hezbollah come about? Well, um, my history may be wrong, but from what I understand is after the Israeli intervention in Lebanon um, and the resulting Sabah and Shatala massacre, which was never actually dealt with properly because the IDF is always quite opaque, um, building on the resemblance and the vacuum caused by the fact that PLO left after that, um, Hezbollah stepped into the, um, <coughs> into the void and, um, and became the main power and created on the anti-Israel sentiment after the violence that happened. And it's often the same way. Loads of inadequate and terrible regimes in the Middle East, you know, Iran and Syria, are bolstered by the fact that um, they oppose Israel and, you know, can tap into this pan-Arab nationalism. So, um, I think that, you know... Can you show this? And, um, yeah, yes, well, um, that's all I... Like. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> As ever, we raise many more questions than we can necessarily handle, particularly in a one minute sum, summing up from the panel. One of the things that struck me is, uh, within this discussion, is I've always believed in the potential of people to change things and ideas uh, informing that, hence my involvement in the battle of ideas. But it does strike me that the discussion uh, about how it, what's changed and what's new informs it with a notion that people are fixed. Uh, in this very particular sense, and it's being reflected in the discussion and the debate. And that's the thing that I find very concerning, and I'm interested to hear if we can challenge that, uh, you know, stand up and be counted, but what, what ideas may have to do that. Uh, I'm going to go in a slightly different order summing up. I'd like uh, Paul to do it first. It's very difficult to do this because it's a minute you've got, but uh, we will continue throughout the rest of the day discussing and arguing around. Paul. Uh, uh, briefly, on the North Island analogy, even if there is a two-state solution, which I by the hope there will be soon. It will be flawed in all sorts of ways, just as an ordinary settlement now is flawed. It's still a really vast improvement 
on, on the sectarian conflict as before. And, and no question, just to say, it's a vast, vast improvement. Um, the analogy is often made and shows that you should talk to people who are terrorists, Hamas, or whatever, unconditionally, because that's what happened to the IRA. It did not happen like that. A uh, uh, very strong political framework was laid, laid down by both the British and Irish governments in 1993. They never deviated from those political requirements. They made all kinds of other tactical concessions about prisoners, guns along the way, but they never deviated from those. There was not an unconditional dialogue. I certainly want to make that point. But it is harder, final point, because in Northern Ireland, no great strategic interests were involved. The level of interest is higher in the Middle East between communities, but also there are great strategic interests involved on both on, on both sides, which make this the achievement of the deal much harder. Thank you, Paul. Ben uh, Many times I wonder what uh, is the role of facts of information. What I found out, generally speaking, is that uh, the main role is not of information but of disinformation, in information. Unfortunately, that's why I'm giving in my research, in my work, in my job, mainly uh, these facts. I'll give you just an example because uh, there were many good questions that were raised. I'm sorry, we cannot, I cannot answer all of them, but those of you, I don't want to escape. Those of you who want my answer, I'm here. Uh, get to me and I will answer. Just one thing uh, about the Israeli Empire. I hear it again and again, and I'm coming from uh, one year in the United States with about a week, maybe you have it also here. And then uh, uh, I'm telling people something is very short, don't go. I'm telling people, look, you know that the ex Israeli president was sent to jail to seven years. Moshe Hatzab, maybe many of you uh, know about it. Well, I'm not proud about him, I'm proud about the rule of law. Yes, I'm uh, uh, proud about him. Now, the presiding judge out of three was George Kahn, an Israeli Arab citizen of Israel. But they repeat on saying an apartheid state. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, two quick comments. I am in favor of a two state solution uh, because a one state solution is unthinkable. And a three-state solution is also lurking in the background. But I think we only get to it by perhaps a slightly different version of butting out. Which is, somebody mentioned the persecution, which I think does form attitude. It made me think about education. They're connected. I was the only Jewish child at a state primary school in London, and then the only Jewish child in my secondary school. And from age five, I had to cope with it. You killed Jesus. From the age five, they know that already. And that's, I had to sit through all the religion lessons and all the sermons. There was a sermon on Sunday. I think it was called Conversion of the Jews Sunday, something like that. I lived with it from age five to age 18. And that gets absorbed at their mother's knees and caused me to go the other way. So I think people have to lay off and there has to be proper education. Too many people think Israel started in 1948. They haven't read the Bible. They haven't read the works. They don't know of the nationality and the right to self-determination, which has a history of many, many thousand years. Start with self-determination. Stop the persecution. And things will improve. Okay, well, since I've only got one minute, I can't really deal with lots of interesting questions, such as the one on education or divisions inside Israel, very important questions. Just to focus on the question uh, from the woman near the front, uh, I mean, I, I wish there had been a sort of Palestine solidarity activist to the degree to be on the panel, that would be fantastic. But having said that, I absolutely disagree with you that there are not important disagreements on the panel. In particular, you know, the discussion about whether or not the West can play a positive role in the region. That is an absolutely crucial debate to have. I don't know where you stand. You know, we can have different people do have different views. And in fact, my view that the West should fight out is very much the minority view. But that is a key discussion to have rather than the kind of arid waving the flags, we love the Palestinians, we love the Israelis kind of debates, which are usually completely arid. And also the discussion of why the people have raised. Why is it now that 
anti-Israel sentiment, I would argue anyway, has taken on a different form. What's really driving it? These are really crucial discussions. We have to start discussing these things before we can have any hope of having real peace, rather than just getting into this kind of arid play-acting, which is what passes for debate at the moment. Uh, can we thank our panel? For the <laughs>